The maiden burns. A saint chosen by God to liberate France, condemned to die as a heretic. The most hateful poet could not create such an image. Liberating city after city, and then traded like a common soldier. For two years, she was under your wing, under your gaze. You were this angel's devil. The battlefield was your sanctuary, blood, your sacrament. And yet, you were not the one tied to the stake, though your crimes far outnumbered hers. The maiden burns in a blaze of glory. The heat of her blooming divinity singes your face. Your chances of victory burn away with her. She carried the banner of destiny, but now your name will die with the war. No. The name of your house will endure. Cruelty forged your bones and spite runs cold in your blood. You will burn brighter than the maiden ever did. The maiden burns. And all you can do is laugh. The Duchy of Brittany was a critical stronghold in the Hundred Years' War, and whoever controlled that region held a lot of political power. In the 14th century, it was the houses of Montfort and the houses of Pentive, duking it out to see who would become the Duke. England backed the House of Montfort, but France backed the House of Pentive. Through the Treaty of Guerande, the English-backed Jean de Montfort was named Duke John IV of Brittany, who, now that he was Duke, eyed the desirable, very prestigious barony of Ray. Fortunately for the new duke of the region, the man who kept the barony, Gerard Chabot, passed away in 1371. Chabot had been a critical ally of the House of Pentive and was now conveniently out of the way. Unfortunately for the new duke, Gerard's sister Jeanne collected the inheritance. Now, King Charles V of France was very keen on helping the House of Ray stay out of the hands of the new duke. And so, he entrusted the barony to Guy Brumont de Montmorency Laval, a relative of Jeanne's, and this infuriated Duke John IV. Ray was the home of the castle of Machecoul, and its border along the marshes of Brittany and Poitou made the area a stronghold. Because Ray was such a critical fief, uh, Duke John IV was willing to take it by force and sent troops in to occupy it. This turned into a long legal battle that lasted until 1399 when the Duke finally kicked the bucket. With Duke John IV out of the picture, Jeanne could finally settle the estate the way she wanted. Having no children, she chose Guy Bremont's son, also called Guy de Montmorency Laval. She later retracted this wish in favor of a settlement with her father, Jean de Crown, who was lord of La Suze and Chantrosse. This led to more lawsuits. The matter would not be settled until Guy de Montmorency Laval agreed to marry Jean de Crown's daughter, Marie. As a result of this union, the son of Guy de Montmorency Laval and Marie de Crown, Gilles de Ray, would be connected to three major feudal houses. The House of Crown, a prominent Western family, the House of Laval, which connected him to the Breton lineage, and the House of Montmorency, dripping with its own prestige in the Duchy of Brittany. And everyone wanted a piece of Ray. Gilles de Ray was born around 1404 in the Black Tower of the Castle of Chamtosse. Because he was a child before the internet, he spent a lot of time illuminating manuscripts and learning Latin. His parents died when he was 11, and he and his brother René de la Suze were sent to live with their maternal grandfather, Jean de Crown. Because he was sent to live with his grandfather at such a formative age, his grandfather's personality and habits rubbed off on young de Ray, and he grew into a prickly and ill-tempered young man. As their guardian, de Crown sought to strategically marry off his grandsons and thereby increase his own social standing because he deserved a cut for arranging these unions, come on. As early as 1417, he tried marrying Gilles to Jean Penel, an heiress of Normandy. Because the Parliament of Paris forbade Penel from marrying until she was of age, this engagement fell through. Two years later, he set up Gilles de Ray with Beatrice de Rohan, who was a niece of Duke John V. This too led to nothing, but there is no documented reason why. 
Finally, at the age of 16, Gilles de Ray was betrothed to Catherine de Tours. Catherine was the daughter of Mills II de Tours and Beatrice de Montjean. Despite the fact that Jean de Crown had a good feeling about this union, Catherine's parents opposed it because they didn't want to bring together the houses of Crown and the houses of Pousages and Tefauges. That and Catherine and Gilles were technically cousins, which meant that the union would lead to inbreeding. So Gilles kidnapped Catherine and married her anyway on November 30th, 1420. Thankfully, the church declared this union incestuous and had it annulled, but that didn't stop Gilles and his grandfather. As soon as Mills de Tours was dead, they tried again. The Bishop of Angers said Gilles and Catherine had to separate and be penitent before absolving them of the sin of incest and allowing them to marry on June 26, 1422 because that's how incest works. This brought the houses of Crown and Tours together, raising the status of the House of Ray higher than it had ever been before. Now, just because Gilles was now the male heir of all of these houses, there was no guarantee that Catherine's lands and titles would come to him when her parents died. Jean de Crown and Gilles immediately went to work trying to secure Beatrice de Montjean's dowry, namely the castles of Pousages and Tifauges. Because Gilles was the oldest male heir, the lands would normally go to him in the events of his mother-in-law's death. However, Beatrice de Montjean remarried, meaning her new husband, Jacques Machin de la Roche Arault, would inherit those titles. So Gilles had his mother-in-law kidnapped and he and his grandfather threatened to sew her into a bag and throw her into the river if she refused to give up her dowry. Jacques Machine freaked out and sent for his wife and his sister. Deray threw her on the pile for good measure. But anyone Machine sent to retrieve them, Jean de Crown just threw in prison. Eventually, Jean Wives and de Cille convinced him to release them. The Parliament of Paris heard this case and the two families negotiated the terms. Jacques Machine would keep Pousages and Gilles Deray would keep Tifoges, but Deray had one final trick up his sleeve. He believed that his wife should bear the name of Pousages in the world and decided to use extortion to pry Pousages from Machine. It was recorded that the first president of the French parliament, Adam de Cambrai, was assaulted and robbed by two men on his way to settle the estates of the two men. Curiously enough, no one was convicted in this little scuffle. Climbing tooth and nail to the top leaves a lot of blood on your hands, but that didn't seem to bother the men of Ray very much. And why should it? They now controlled one of the most coveted, prosperous baronies in all of Brittany. Against the backdrop of all of these legal battles and kidnappings was war. The War of the Succession of Brittany had been settled, but was not quite settled enough. Even though the House of Montfort had been the reigning family since 1365, the House of Pentive, the ones who lost out on the Treaty of Guérande, still carried a bit of a grudge. Members of the House ambushed Duke John V and imprisoned him in 1420. Not one to pass on the opportunity for advancement, Gilles de Ray's grandfather Jean de Crown actually threw his support behind the Montfort family despite being a Pentive man back in the day. While the Dauphin of France, Charles VII, was all for the Pentives attacking the Montforts, it had real France versus England energy. He eventually recanted asking the Pentives to release John V, which they did. Additionally, the Bretons convinced the English to release Count Arthur de Richemont, brother to John V. The Pentives ended up abandoning the castle Chamtoseau when the castle was burnt to the ground. What this did was put Jean de Crown and by extension Gilles de Ray in good graces with Duke John V, which earned them more lands that had been confiscated in the conflict. France was messy, and this paints a small picture of a greater conflict. At home in France, you have a civil war between the Burgundians, a county ceded by England through the Treaty of Bretigny, and the Armagnacs, who favored French rule and the Dauphin. Then you had international conflict between the English and the French. In 1420, the Treaty of Troyes was signed, naming King Henry V of England as heir to King Charles VI of France. Meanwhile, John V of Brittany was still very upset about the whole Pentive debacle, and so he threw his support behind Henry V instead of the Dauphin. However, this would only last until 1427 when he took back his support and threw it behind the French nobility instead. And after all the work Jean de Crown and Gilles de Ray did to remain in the Duke's good graces, 
Gilles actually decided to remain loyal to the King of France. This is a lot of overarching geopolitical conflict and I want to take a quick breather. Uh, we're skipping over about seven years of war details because the, the specifics of who won which battle are not what I want to focus on for this video. The important takeaway is that Gilles de Rais had to take up arms to defend his land and titles. And de Rais was distinguished on the battlefield, so much so that his glaring character flaws were waved away because he was so good at war, guys. Like, we'll send this guy to therapy as soon as his personality stops being useful. And when the English laid siege to Orleans, Charles VII had just the job that would put Gilles de Rais's frightening prowess to use. In 1429, Gilles de Ray signed an alliance with his cousin, the Grand Chamberlain La Tremois. This was done so that the Grand Chamberlain could kind of play the field and stay in the king's favor, but it also kept Gilles de Ray in the necessary circles to maintain his own power and favor with the king. This seemed to be paying off because Charles VII had chosen Gilles de Ray to be part of his entourage, and de Ray was present at the castle of Chinon when Jean of Arc arrived in February 1429. Gilles was to march by her side on the battlefields of France, watching over her as she carried her banner. The king and theologians of Chinon allow Jeanne of Arc to march with the relief army in Blois. This was where she reconnected with Gilles de Ray, who was commanding troops alongside Jean de Brosse. They sent them to Orleans to try and lift the siege. Jeanne of Arc of course wanted to liberate the city, but she wanted to be careful about it. John the Bastard of Orleans, the head of the Orleans house, wanted her to pick up the pace and convinced her to go ahead and attack. Gilles de Ray was to return to Blois in the meantime. He joined Joan of Arc a few days later, and they liberated Orleans. Saving the city was huge, and it gave Joan of Arc a lot of clout, which she used to convince Charles VII to go to Reims and be crowned king. Her influence held a lot of sway, leading a lot of Charles' vassals to take up arms in the name of the man they wanted to be king. The English occupied a lot more cities than just Orleans, so Joan of Arc and Gilles de Ray joined forces to keep the momentum going. They were victorious in Jargo and Pate less than a week apart, all while marching towards Reims for Charles VII's coronation. In recognition of his feats of reckless heroism, Gilles de Ray was one of four lords selected to bring the Holy Ampola from Saint Remy to Notre Dame and Reims. The Holy Ampola was used for anointing French kings from 1131 to 1774, and in de Ray's case it was for anointing Charles VII, and on this auspicious day de Ray was also made a Marshal of France. With a new king on the throne, it was time to liberate Paris. Jean of Arc personally requested Gilles de Ray fight alongside her at Port saint honore and over the next two weeks they fought to lift the siege. They tried to march through the front gates, but a crossbow bolt shot Jean of Arc in the thigh and they were forced to retreat. Despite the loss, King Charles VII still recognized the bravery of Jean of Arc and Gilles de Ray, bestowing the honor of having the arms of France added to their coat of arms, an honor only the two of them shared. Things would not last forever, as in May of 1431, Jean of Arc was captured by Burgundian troops and traded to the English. They deemed her a heretic and burned her at the stake, relieving Gilles of his duty to her. We don't know for certain how Jean's death affected Gilles de Ray, as we do not have much in the way of their personal writings, but her death doesn't seem to slow down his bloodshed and hunger for glory. We see him continue to serve the Grand Chamberlain as he did swear an oath to him. And at the moment, the Grand Chamberlain was locked in a battle with the House of Anjou. He captured a prominent captain of the Anjou men-at-arms, Jean de Bouillel, and it didn't matter that the captain used to fight alongside Gilles de Ray, nor did it matter that he was a relative of Gilles by marriage, he was an enemy of the Grand Chamberlain, and that was enough. Bouillel escaped and tried to take over the city of Sable, but Gilles thwarted that swiftly. Gilles was on a roll, lifting the siege of Lagny in August 1432, and two months later, his grandfather Jean de Crown would pass away. This meant... Gilles de Ray could now call the shots for how the House of Ray would be run. When he wasn't breaking sieges, Gilles de Ray was constantly taking up arms on behalf of his cousin, the Grand Chamberlain La Tremois. Courtiers conspired to take his titles and his lands all the time. Some even attempted to have Georges de La Tremois removed from court. One of them eventually succeeded with Charles VII removing the Grand Chamberlain's influence in court and bestowing it on the House of Anjou. Georges tried to use what influence he still had over his cousin to convince him to keep fighting the Burgundians in the Hundred Years' War, but by this point Gilles was not interested in fighting anymore, and he had no grandfather to tell him to fight anyway. Plus, he was running low on cash. Not that he was spending it wisely.
Gilles de Rey spent two years building a chapel of the Holy Innocents for himself in 1434. He dragged dozens of people into this routine, making them altar boys and chaplains. There was an organ that he would have carried out in front of him, and he would give mass at this cathedral dressed head to toe in gaudy robes that he made for himself. His family, extremely perturbed by the fact he was using family money to build this cathedral, asked Pope Eugene IV to declare de Rey's chapel of the Holy Innocents as not a real church. And, uh, sorry guys, the Pope said no. So his chapel continued to function with family money. The following year, in 1435, Gilles de Rey put together what could only be described as a spectacle. Le Mystère des Sieges de Orleans, or The Mystery of the Siege of Orleans. This production had over 20,000 lines of verse from 140 speaking roles, and there were 500 extras on top of that. They made 600 costumes and plied the audience with free food and wine. DeRay was pretty much bankrupt before curtains up, and he was selling property as fast as he could to stay in the black, like that was even possible. By opening night, he was down to two castles. Sacre bleu. Having been born into money and then married off into even more money, Gilles de Rey spent his wealth like it was never going to run out. Part of the issue came now from how Gilles de Rey was trying to earn the family's money back. Gilles de Rey would sell off lands connected to his family, borrowing from people, selling family jewels at far less than what they were worth, and then buying back at a loss to try and keep these things in the family. He spent so much of his family's money and sold off so much land that when his grandfather died in 1432, he left his sword and armor to René, Gilles' younger brother, because he was so disgusted with how Duray conducted the family finances. It wasn't until Gilles Duray sold off five major holdings to Duke John V of Brittany that his younger brother, René de la Seuss, and other family members decided to stage an intervention and sue. Now, King Charles VII of France was more than happy to screw over de Rey, whom he had summoned in August of 1434, threatening to strip him of the title of Marshal because he didn't intervene when Duke Philip of Burgundy seized the city of Grancy. So King Charles VII happily sided with René and the rest of de Rey's family in the banning de Rey from selling any more property. He couldn't make any new contracts with subjects of Charles VII, and anyone who had a de Rey property could not sell it through land sales. The king wanted to go even further and prevent the in-progress sales made to John V, which de la Suze was in favor of because it meant that the lands and titles could stay with the family, but Duke John V opposed that measure of the suit. In the end, the lands stayed with the family, and Gilles de Rey gave one of the five keeps, Saint Etienne de Mermort, to his brother. And then five years later tried to take it back by force, staged a full coup and everything. You would think that meant he would hold on to it this time, but no. He alienated the land again through a business deal with a man named Geoffrey de Le Ferron, who was connected to Duke John V. This alienation was still compliant with the king's decrees because it wasn't a sale exactly. To alienate land in this context is strictly a transfer of ownership. When de Rey tried to claim the castle again, the man responsible for maintaining Saint Etienne, Geoffrey's brother Jean Le Ferron, opposed it. Jean Le Ferron was a tonsured cleric at Saint Etienne, and de Rey knew this. So because Jean Le Ferron opposed the return handoff, de Rey stormed the parish on the day of Pentecost in 1440, interrupting mass and threatening to kill Jean Le Ferron with a polearm if he didn't leave and let Gilles de Rey take the holdings back. He took Le Ferron prisoner, and after multiple demands from Duke John V to return Le Ferron, Gilles de Rey moved his imprisoned cleric to Tafoge, which was outside Duke John V's jurisdiction. After this incident, they opened what was called an Inquisition Infamy, or secret investigation into de Rey. Jean de Malatois traveled to Nantes to begin collecting testimonies, beginning with the parish of Notre Dame. They found more than a few skeletons in de Rey's closet, all of them belonging to children. It was not uncommon for children to disappear in medieval society. If a child became a page or servant of some nobleman, it was entirely possible parents just wouldn't see their kids again. Once you entered a noble house to serve, there was no time to go back home and tell your parents. In 1432, a 12-year-old boy named Judon disappeared in the village of Machacoul. And as we've just mentioned, that normally wouldn't have been a big deal. But children kept disappearing. Around Nantes, this was becoming more of an open secret. Multiple witnesses saw Gilles de Rey's servants dumping bodies down a well. 
but if it's your word against the word of the richest and most powerful man in the region, who are you going to tell? The exact number is not known. From the documentation, there are eight named children for certain, but it could have been as many as 140. One estimate puts it over 300. So many children disappeared around Mashakul that when a shoemaker told the villagers of Saint Jean de Angeli that he was from Mashakul, they were horrified. They told him they let little children be eaten there. It appears Gilderay's reputation preceded him. What started as an investigation into heresy spiraled into a case about kidnapping, sodomy, and murder. They wanted to resolve this case and put Doré away as quickly as possible because it was embarrassing to the royal court if a high-ranking official was guilty of such horrifying deeds. They heard the testimony of 30 parents who lived in and around Nantes. All of their testimonies revolved around the fact that their children were missing around Mashakul, but those specific testimonies could be broken down into three categories. No mention of Duray, suggesting Duray had something to do with it, and outright accusing Duray of kidnapping their children. It took five days to finish the trial because people needed time to cope with what they were hearing. The judge had ordered a lot of the testimony to be stricken from the record because so much of it was so graphic. Two of the Baron's valets gave testimony on October 17th, detailing the ritual Gilles Duray would undertake. According to their testimony, DeRay took pleasure in creating a feeling of terror in these children. He would lure them into his castle, treat them to a lavish experience, drug them, take them upstairs, and then reveal to them what was really going on. The valets asserted that he boasted of having a greater delight in killing and slaughtering, or having killed the said boys and girls, in seeing them languish and die, and cutting off their heads and limbs and seeing the blood, than in exerting lust on them. After the incision of the vein of the neck and throat of said children or other parts of the body, and when the blood flowed, and also after the decapitation, practiced as it is said above, he sometimes sat on their belly and delighted in seeing them die like this, and he sat down at a better angle to see their end and death. And it turned out DeRay had help. There was a guy named Francisco Perlati who claimed they were trying to summon a demon named Baron at the castle to Foges. Apparently they were under the impression that summoning a demon would give DeRay a chance to recoup his fortunes. It did not. It ended up being a perfect medieval trial for the reasons in which DeRay was on trial to begin with. Medievalist Jacques Chiffalo says that the accusations form an obligatory triptych, rebellion against the king, pacts with the devil, and unnatural acts against children. They planned on using torture to get the confession, but DeRay confessed everything voluntarily, freely, and painfully on October 21st. He was sentenced to be hanged and burned in the presence of the victims' families. Francisco Perlotti managed to escape life imprisonment. His servants were completely burned at the stake. But Gilles de Ray was partially burned at the stake, hanged until dead, and then buried at Notre Dame de Carmes in Nantes on October 26, 1440. Medieval justice is known for being less than just. Torture was frequently employed to get confessions out of the accused, and while DeRay confessed before he could be tortured, his servants were tortured into confessing a lot of the crimes they participated in. This has prompted a lot of people to scrutinize DeRay's trial and execution and pose the question, was Gilles DeRay framed for his crimes? Historians point to the Duke of Brittany as a possible explanation for DeRay being framed. In DeRay's trial, there was a secular and an ecclesiastical piece, one to handle the legal crime and one to handle the religious crime. The Duke of Brittany prosecuted the secular case that convicted DeRay. And after DeRay was executed, the Duke of Brittany absorbed all of the titles to DeRay's lands. Keep in mind that the Duke of Brittany couldn't just buy this land. DeRay was forbidden from selling to anyone under the edict from the king in 1435. Others have come to DeRay's defense for different reasons. Alistair Crowley, an occultist, Natch, called DeRay the male equivalent of Joan of Arc, who was really only guilty of the pursuit of knowledge, which I think is very generous. Skeptics went so far as to do a mock retrial of DeRay in 1992. Jean-Yves Gou Brissonnier pled de Ray's case, asking for people to re-examine the evidence they had back in the 15th century. Supposedly, the verdict came back not guilty, though many question the mockery trial's exclusions of qualified medieval historians. 
Plus, some reporters speculate that the mockery trial was just to promote a book about Jules de Ray, so there's that. At least for the historians that I found quotes from, they think Gilles de Ray is guilty, at least of most of his crimes. Valérie Touré said that even if Duke John V was interested in seizing land, the testimonies of parents is still too strong to rely on the innocence of Gilles de Ray. Similarly, Claude Gauvard says that while the numbers may not be as high as some speculate, de Ray definitely kidnapped and murdered a bunch of children in pursuit of some dark and twisted end. History is full of corrupt, terrible, awful people. People are capable of tremendous feats of heroism in liberating an entire town and horrific feats of depravity in allegedly murdering hundreds of children. But for better or for worse, history isn't written by the people who get executed. And Jules de Ray is no exception. So as a massive disclaimer, a huge boon in my research came from French Wikipedia. Uh, Wikipedia jokes aside, I was able to find a lot of French language sources that I could Google Translate into an English I could understand. Uh, but the most hilarious thing about this research has been that at every turn, every juicy, salacious detail has been kind of like hem-hawed away with like, well, there's no real evidence to suggest this event ever happened, or well, there's nothing to suggest these two figures were anything more than colleagues, which is kind of a bummer, but it was still a rewarding experience to work with the details that I could verify. The idea for this video came from watching Fate Zero with my husband. Uh, there was, there's no easy way to explain this anime because that in itself is a subject of multiple videos, uh, but I'll just say Fate Zero is really, really good and you should watch it. But in Fate Zero, there are seven mages participating in this ritual called the Holy Grail War, and each mage summons a combatant called a servant who is a heroic spirit, which basically just means they are the embodiment or manifestation of a great figure in history, and here great implies both good and bad. One of the mages ends up being this guy named Ryunosuke Uryu, who is himself a serial killer. He has latent magic in his bloodline, and he uh, finds the book on summoning servants at his parents' house. And Ryunosuke summons the caster servant, who is Shil de Rey. And they learn immediately they have a lot in common, and are super excited to commit some crimes that are so terrible God himself decides to intervene. Let me tell you, I was stunned to learn that the child murders were underplayed in the anime. But yeah, it was, it was a really good anime, 8.9 out of 10. I, I guess I'll, I'll leave with this bizarre fun fact that I found. There are no citations to it, so it's entirely possible that it is just made up. But supposedly, uh, Jules de Ray's daughter Marie erected a stone memorial at his execution site. It was thought that Saint Anne presided over this site, and pregnant women would come to pray at the site for an abundance of breast milk. This memorial lasted until the French Revolution, when it was destroyed by uh, the Jacobins. Okay, now I'm done.